The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. So our lecture tonight is dedicated to Frank and Kathy Rohr. This is an endowed lecture series that was the inspiration of their daughter, Suzanne Angelucci, to honor her parents and is intended to support public education by funding areas of humor, positive attitudes towards life, and a strong social support system and the effects that they have on longevity. She started this program back in the 80s, so she really was a forward thinker in terms of her interest in longevity and the positive characteristics that might impact that. So I'd like to take a moment to thank Suzanne for her dedication and commitment to inspiring this great lecture series tonight. It's really my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Howard Friedman is distinguished professor of psychology at University of California, Riverside. He graduated from Yale and then obtained his PhD at Harvard. He was a National Science Foundation graduate fellow at Harvard. He has been involved in research on longevity and aging for many years. The most important part is for the last 25 years, he has been heading the longevity project. And you will hear more about it in his talk. But this is perhaps the longest running study of aging anywhere in the world. Started back in 1921. Of course, Dr. Friedman was not there, <laughs> but he has been leading the effort since for the last 25 years. And this work has resulted in more than 150 papers published in peer-reviewed journals, book chapters, and he recently, in 2011, published a book called The Longevity Project, and that book has become one of the best sellers. It also has been translated uh, into different languages, and he has traveled all over the world to spread the message of healthy aging and longevity. Dr. Friedman introduced two new terms which are actually quite important. One is disease-prone personality and another is self-healing personality. And now these terms have become part of everyday lexicon. Dr. Friedman has received multiple awards. One of them is a prestigious award from the Association for Psychological Sciences. It is called James McKean Cattell Award for what they said, his work on changing how we think about the nature of health. Another award is a prestigious also award from American Psychological Association. And that is for outstanding contributions to health psychology. Dr. Friedman is actually one of the pioneers in developing the area of health psychology and promoting it. So please join me in giving a big hand to Dr. Friedman. Thank you so much, and thank you to the sponsors for funding this lecture and to, to um, all of you for, for coming out. It looks like it's a great turnout. It's a great, to see, great to see a packed house. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, many, many years ago, when um, there really wasn't a field of health psychology, uh, I, I, I knew a lot of psychology, but I didn't know much about 
the medical side. And so I needed a place where I could kind of visit and hang out and see what was going on and what the issues were from the medical side. And I came here to UCSD Medical School. I was just an assistant professor. And Dr. Doris Howell kind of threw open the doors to me. And I was in, in the hospital and the ICUs and in the residencies and teaching medical students and so on. And then um, when I launched the study that I'm ta I'll be talking about today, in the, in the early 1990s, I also um, had two collaborators here, Dr. Mike Crickey in cardiology and um, Dr. Debbie, Debbie Wingard in, in, in epidemiology. So, there's, so it's re really great to come back here and be able to talk about this, the places that really helped get it launched. I think you're going to appreciate my uh, scientific research findings because what I can tell, many of you are already um, carrying them out. But still, you'll see we have a lot of surprises. So let me start by saying, how many of you have seen magazine articles that say things like, um, 100 ways to live to 100? <laughs> OK. Um, and how many of you have lived to 100? 90? <laughs> OK, well, um, I'm, I'm teasing to some extent, but the, the lists um, are really problematic. They say things like, don't stress, get married, eat broccoli, and go to the gym. Um, well, um, it, it, if you've lived to 100 or 90, you might say you don't, you don't really need to be here. But um, m many of those lists are, are, are reporting correlations. They're reporting associations. And so they're really misleading. They're not really un, uh, explaining causes. We need to understand the causal pathways to healthy aging. And that's what I'll be talking about today. But here's an example where these kinds of lists go wrong. So we know there's a strong correlation between being married and being healthy. Um, but it's probably not the case that marriage is usually causing good health, contrary to what the lists say. Um, a few weeks ago, some of you might have heard that the world's oldest woman died, Emma Moreno, in Italy. She was um, 117. And um, she, she was not in my study, but she had a very interesting story. Um, way back uh, early in her life, she, she got married, but she had a very difficult marriage. And even though she lived to 117, at, at some point, she decided this was not good. And she threw her husband out of the house. This was back in 1938. <laughs> well, this, this was confirmed in our own study that um, we found that women who simply got rid of their husbands in a poor marriage, they actually thrived and lived long and did fine. <laughs> Well, what's unique about my study is that it follows people from childhood throughout their whole lives through death. And um, part of what I, want was, what I was asked to do here was to focus on the role of positive traits in thriving. And um, part of this is also we need to think about stress. What's the best way to think about stress? We always hear, your stress is killing you. You need an easier job. You need to slow down and take it easy. You need a more selfish focus on pampering yourself is really what it said. Is this true? Is this really the self-healing personality? You all know the book um, Robinson Crusoe, who was written by Daniel Defoe. Well, Daniel Defoe, um, he wrote that almost exactly 300 years ago. But he's, he's known for a quote from another one of his characters who said, the best of men cannot suspend their fate. The good die early, and the bad die late. Now, Wordsworth likewise said, the good die first. Um, actually, the sentiment dates back to ancient Greek mythology. And really, it comes to, from the fact that when we see someone young um, die prematurely, um, we, we, we like to rationalize that and say, well, the good die young. But is that, is that really true? And I'm going to answer that question for you today. Now, um, more recently, there's a lot of films and a hit song from Billy Joel that um, touched on this. And uh, you know you might know this song. Well, they showed you a statue, told you to pray. They built you a temple and locked you away, Bob. But they never told you the price that you'd pay for the things you might have done. Only the good die young. <laughs> well, now, now, now you know why I'm a professor and not a rock and roll singer. Billy Joel actually grew up not that far from me. But we took different career pathways. And that's what I'll be talking about, um, the pathways that, that people take. So let's, let, let's first spend a minute um, thinking about what it means to be healthy and thriving. Now, you know public health agencies around the world focus on longevity. And that's because longevity is probably the best single measure of health. I heard Michael Bloomberg once say, uh, arguably, the primary purpose of government is to increase life expectancy. 
well, why is this? There's a lot of truth to that, and it's because health is not merely the absence of disease. Um, it includes a pathway in which you can think clearly, be productive, interact with other people, and of course, stay alive. Now, another comment I often hear when I talk about this is something like, I don't care about living long, I just want to be ha happy and healthy while I live. Well, this is really uninformed at best. It's really misleading. It falsely assumes, assumes an increasing decrepitude after age 50. Um, but you, you hear it from even um, experienced medical researchers. For you, you, you see articles like, why I hope to die at 75, the idea being, after that, it, it, there's no quality of life. But in fact, the people who live beyond 75 are those who are generally healthy in their 40s and in their 50s and in their 60s, and they're happier too. Now, well over people, half of people in their 50s are going to live well beyond 80. So if you say, I hope to die at age 75, what you're really saying is that you hope, you hope to suffer with cancer or heart disease or lung disease throughout your 50s and 60s, then you'll be sure to be dead at 75. That's not what people mean. A lot of problems when you don't study longevity is that there's too much focus in research on self-reported health. And that's, that's very misleading in a lot of ways. I'm not going to go into it all, but um, if we study people who are initially healthy and then follow them, um, we, we avoid all kinds of selection artifacts and biases. You see this in medical studies published every, every, every week where only certain people either enter a study, like if you're a complaining neurotic person, you're more likely to seek medical care and you wind up in a study. And, and a lot of people who stays in the medical study as well as the people who are, certain, who are different from the people who will drop out of the study. So there are a lot of biases that creep in and, and, and often they're misinterpreted. Um, with longevity, we don't have that kind of selection problem, right? Um, so we need to consider all outcomes as well. It doesn't make much sense to me to say, well, this person was cured of cancer if the same day then they die of, a, of heart disease, right? We, we want to, it doesn't only make sense to think of something that's helping you if you thrive in, in all ways, not just curing one disease one by one. So that's not a correct understanding of health. We need to look at all outcomes. Now to start looking at this, I want to show you, um, this, is, uh, this slide is death rates by age. And after age 25, when your risk of dying from disease is very, very small, your probability of dying rises exponentially. So it doubles about every eight years, and it looks something like this across the lifespan. Now, um, you can see it stays low because it starts very low at 25, so it stays low for many years even though it's doubling. Um, but you can see a lot of action is going on here in the, in the 50s and people's 60s and 70s. So a lot of people become sick and die in these decades, and there is a huge amount of variation here. Um, and so there's a possibility of prevention. After age 80 or 85, th there's uh, obviously we want to do what we can, but there's much less variation. So there's much less room for change. Um, so the reality is, again, that people who live in, into their 80s or, or higher are thriving wonderfully in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. And we want to know, who are these people? That's what we set out to discover. <laughs> now, you may have heard this commonly reported statistic that life expectancy has risen by 20 to 30 years in the 20th century. But this is life expectancy at birth. This includes the tremendous gains in infant mortality and child mortality. It's not the case that most 85-year-olds are now living to 115. Okay, so it, it's, we need to focus on health in midlife. That's where we, we can improve people both in those years and, and, and in early old age. Now everybody knows it's good to stay fit, right? Stay trim, sleep well, eat right, don't smoke, uh, breathe clean air, don't get depressed, and buckle up. <laughs> so why isn't everybody really healthy? Well, um, this is a really overly simple, simple approach to give people lists of things to do. And um, Groucho Marx captured this. He said, age is not particularly interesting. Anyone can get old. All you have to do is live long enough. <laughs> so um, year, years ago, I became interested in why some people live long and others die young. So some people thrive, they recover from illness, and they go on to live long, healthy lives. But others are the same age, they're miserable, they, they're sickly, and they suffer premature death. Again, um, I've had many terrific collaborators over the years on this project, and I certainly like, want to thank them. And um, I also want to thank the National Institute on, Institute on Aging, which has funded a lot of this research, but of course I take all responsibility. And um, primarily what I'm talking about today is our work with the Terman Life Cycle Study, and I'll explain what that is. 
So um, not long ago, I flew up to uh, San Francisco to attend the 104th birthday party of one of the Terman participants. He entered the study about 100 years ago. He got up and gave a speech, and he particularly thanked me for coming as one of the people who come. He had become a friend of mine. Um, and um, unfortunately, he died about six months later. But he wanted me to help, to help me publicize what he and I thought about healthy aging. Um, he was, up until his death, he was still active, and he still worked. It was mostly volunteer work, fund, fundraising work. He actually embodied many of the characteristics of those who have long, thriving lives. And I'll explain to you what many of those are. Now, growing up, I used to watch the I Love Lucy show. Uh, I guess it's still available in reruns or on DVDs. And um, Lucy joked that the secret to staying young is live honestly, eat slowly, and lie about your age. Now, um, living honestly turns out to be really important. But e eating slowly doesn't much matter. Now, you could say, Dr. Friedman, how, how would you know that? How could you do that? Um, well, how would I know that eating slowly earlier in life or having a certain personality pattern is, keeps you healthy or, or living longer or doesn't? Well, we have data on children who are followed their whole lives, and those were questions that were asked and assessments that were made. And it turns out that eating slowly as a child has no effect at all on your later health and longevity, but personality does. So this, this century-long study that I'm talking about is really the only one of its kind. Um, Lucy was not in the study, but one of her closest associates was. My study is about why some people seem to have good luck in their health, but it really turns out it's not good luck at all. It's a very small um, aspect of people's thriving is due to chance, but most of it's not really good luck at all. Some people make themselves lucky, and I'm going to explain how that happens. Now, when you ask most people, why does somebody live long, they say, of course, it's in the genes, um, but it's not true. We know this from twin studies. Let me illustrate the point. So a few years ago, I met with a pair of 100-year-old identical twins. They were not in our Terman study. And they said their secret was salad. I eat salad. I eat salad, too. <laughs> Well, they're, they're obviously looking back at trying to explain how they thrived and lived to 100. Well, there are over a million identical twins in the US, and there are about 60,000 US centenarians, people who have lived to 100. Um, but there are only about five pairs of identical twin centenarians. Um, approximately one quarter of the variation in longevity is due to genes. That's, that's, that's important. That's something. But more than half comes from uh, the variation comes from behaviors and situations from people's life pathways. Here's, here's more to the point. Um, this is more common. Josephine in this picture is healthy, but her identical twin sister has multiple health problems. You might say, well, she's probably been exposed to harmful environments. She had a good time in college, but look at her now. But, but we'll see that it's, it's much more complicated than that. So you can't really predict how long you're going to live by looking at your relatives. It, it turns out that if you're over 100, you probably have some long-lived relatives. But if you have a relative who's lived to 100, sorry, you're very, very unlikely to live to a, over 100 yourself. So people have the capacity to reach old age, most people, but they don't for a whole host of factors. And those are what we've been trying to tease apart. But I have to say a warning, there are no money-back guarantees in longevity research. Now, um, again, why isn't everybody healthy and living long? Well, here's where the principles of scientific contingencies come in. Um, it turns out that combinations, sometimes complicated but understandable, of your inclinations, of your personality traits, and the situations, and the, the, your work, and your friends, combine together to lead you on healthy paths. So organizations, other people, school, friends, can make you healthy, healthier or less healthy. I'll start with a, a, a true story. This is about um, a edu young educational psychologist who was named Lewis Terman. And he moved from the Midwest to California. He, he was interested in education. And he first took a job as a um, school superintendent in San Bernardino. And then he, he became a professor at a recently founded young university called Stanford. And I, ironically, given today's um, conditions, he was suffering, suffering from tuberculosis. 
and he moved to San Bernardino because of the um, dry and very, very clean air. <laughs> well, um, this is Lewis Terman, and um, he started thinking about the future intellectual leadership of our country. So he was partly influenced by Charles Darwin, and he was partly influenced by Alfred Binet, who was the, uh, a French scientist who had invented the first reliable intelligence test. And um, Professor Terman created his own intelligence test, what came to be known as the famous Stanford Binet IQ test, and he started studying intelligent children. So um, he was worried about American competitiveness and American education. He said, how can we raise the future intellectual leaders of our country? We want to have a smart, productive country. What can we do to encourage this kind of thriving, this kind of intellectual thriving, this kind of leadership and accomplishment? He wasn't interested in health. Now, a lot of scientists at this time had political agendas, but Terman was very focused on the science. And I, I've gone through all his writings, and they're full of appeals to be uh, scientific and objective, and he's changed his opinions over the years as things went on. So with a very, he started around World War I, but with a very big push in 1921, he recruited 1,528 boys and girls, and uh, mostly from the San Francisco and LA areas. That's where people lived in those days in, in California. And um, on average, they were about 10 years old. And he started following them, very unusual in the time. Now, e even though I said he came to California for the weather because he was ill, he didn't consider this a health study. So he was really focused on measures of individual characteristics, success, achievement, personal, social, family features. He collected everything he could think of, and he was a very, very smart guy. He, he, he collected information about the children's families, their schooling, their activities, how many books were in their house, did they sleep with the windows open, uh, how active they were in their playtime, how many friends they had how happy their parents' marriages were, and um, additional lots and lots of information about the children themselves reported by their teachers and by their parents. Um, and then he started following them. So, so think about this. We have tremendous information about children, and, and, and they were followed. And although the um, information in the archives is confidential, for the most part, some of the Terman participants who I'll be talking about today, they've proudly identified themselves. They said, I was in the Terman study. I was, I was a bright kid picked by Lewis Terman. And one was Jess Oppenheimer, who worked with Lucy to create the I Love Lucy show. He was born in San Francisco in 1913, and he lived to age 75. If any of you trivia buffs, if you, if you have or buy the DVDs, you can see Jess in episode six of the first season of I Love Lucy. Well, um, seven decades later, another professor, another young psychology professor, that would be me, became interested in individual differences in health and longevity, um, why some people are prone to disease, why some people recover and others don't, why some people live to, to a healthy old age. And there were all kinds of explanations around that time. Um, anxiety, lack of exercise, nerve-wracking careers, risk-taking, disintegrating social groups. Pessimism, poverty, and the type A behavior pattern. You've heard about all these kinds of things. Well, how could we study this? We can't do an experiment in which we randomly assign some children to be sociable and introverted uh, and, or uh, extroverted and other kids to be outgoing and be active. Right, so the best study would be to have a group of children who we assessed and followed step by step throughout their lives. And I thought, gee, that would be a great study. but. The problem was we would be long dead before the results came in, and that wouldn't be any fun at all, right? So um, it turned out I was lucky that one of my colleagues had been doing some work in the Terman archive, and um, she said to me, you know, how about using this kind of archive? And I said, okay, well, let's see what's there. We'll, we'll spend six months studying health and longevity, if we could, in the Terman participants. Well, th almost three, dec three decades later, I'm still at it. And when my uh, college students hear this, they say, Professor, a 30-year study, get a life. Well, um, Terman um, launched the study uh, in 1921. And um, he was in his mid-40s. He died in 1956. But the, fortunately, the study was continued by others. And as I said, we picked it up more than 25 years ago. Uh, the problem was that there was little health and longevity information. So uh, the key to success of our work was to spend many years gathering this kind of information, especially the death certificates from counties and cities across the United States. It's not so easy to do. We didn't really have Social Security uh, numbers. 
Um, a lot of these things were locally filed in those days. It was very frustrating to gather them, but we finally got almost all of them. And um, one tip I can give you from all this is if you want to be studied by health researchers, don't die in New York City. <laughs> now, um, think of what we have. Over 1,500 Californians extensively assessed in childhood and followed throughout their whole lives. Um, we know how, how long they lived and exactly what they died from. We had uh, we used a physician coding of their death certificates. So now we have um, about uh, over 10 million pieces of data already. Now, um, I talked to a number of those in my study who were, who were still alive when we started, but I did, not, I did not ask them their secrets to longevity. Why not? Well, um, studies of centenarians, these are people over 100, they're terribly flawed. So they go and assess, assess the characteristics of very old people. For example, they find that long life people are happy and cheery. But this line of research makes a serious mistake. There's no proper comparison groups. So yeah, people who live to 100 are happy and cheery, but compared to whom? We don't do seances, right? So you really want to compare them to the people who have already died. What, what were they like 50 years ago? Maybe it was the serious strivers at age 50 who went on to be the really happy centenarians at age 100, right? Um, who wouldn't feel cheery and happy at age 100 when they bring in a cake with 100 candles on it? So this flaw in centenarian research helps explain why so many past studies are, have you've heard about are flawed. Um, you know, I hate to say it, but eat all the yogurt you can stand and you still won't live to 100, probably very unlikely. Um, so we, don't, we do study people who live to 100 or who live to old age, 80s, 90s, 100s, but we do so in the context of their full lives from 10 years old on. Some of them are even younger. We don't hold any seances. Um, now, Woody Allen saw through this type of flawed centenarian research. He said, sometimes in the news I see features about certain people who reside in snow-capped regions where a whole village population lives to 140 or so. Of course, all they ever eat is yogurt, and when they finally do die, they are not embalmed, but pasteurized. <laughs> and um, as, as smart as Woody, Woody is, he, he figured out what's probably going on in these studies. Um, he said, these people, they walk every place because try catching a cab in the Himalayas. <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to tell you um, some, of my, some of our most interesting findings. You can imagine we have lots of findings. I'm, I'm going to certainly leave time at the end for, for questions. Now the um, termin participants, they cleverly labeled themselves the termites. They were smart. They thought, well, they found out we're in this elite study. So at, at some point they said, we're going to be termin's termites. Right now, uh, my students were thinking about this, and they, they got bored being called students of Friedman's Longevity Project using the term participants. So they said, we want something clever like the, the term in termites. So they looked around for a better term to call us, and in response to the clever termites, they decided that we would call ourselves the terminators. <laughs> now, I don't want anyone to get he confused here with the former governor, so here is the difference. There's no difference. <laughs> Okay, first time I ever heard that comment, but I'll, I'll, take it, I'll take it as a compliment. Thank you very much. Well, um, so one of the participants in our study, um, one of the children that Dr. Terman recruited almost a century ago was Ed Dimitrik. He was the highly successful, successful director of the Kane Mutiny that was starring Humphrey Bogart in 1954. And I'm going to tell you about him to illustrate one of our core important findings. We always hear advice don't strain, don't work too hard. That turns out to be very poor advice. Um, Dmitryk was the son of a Ukrainian immigrant, and his mother died when he was young, and his father hit him. And um, he, he, um, when he was a teenager, he left home and got a job a a as an usher and as a um, low-paid messenger at Paramount Pictures. And he, but he worked his way up in the film industry, right? He was, he was very ambitious. And he continued to face many remarkable challenges. So his movie career, which was just get, was going quite well, he got, it got stopped abruptly in 1947. He was called before the House on American Activities Committee, and he was one of the Hollywood Ten. He was accused of being a communist or a communist sympathizer. Well, um, he refused to testify. He was defending his freedom of thought and action. And uh, he was cited for contempt of Congress. And he got divorced, and he was sent to federal prison camp. Stress, stress, stress. 
1951, he had been blackballed in Hollywood, blacklisted, he couldn't work, so he decided to change his stance and he, was, he testified some after all. So after that, he was hated by both the left and the right. <laughs> Um, and he, more and more stress, yet his career was spectacularly successful. He went on to direct such stars as Spencer Tracy and Clark Gable, Elizabeth Taylor, Marlon Brando, and Richard Burton. So you might say, well, all this stress might have done him in, right? He, he was a determined participant who died of stress. No, he lived almost a full 20th century. He died on July 1st, 1999, at age 90. So how could someone facing so much stress live such a long and healthy life? Well, because um, Dr. Truman was especially interested in success, as I've said, he um, spent a lot of time gathering information on their careers and their achievements. So in fact, by um, young adulthood, Dr. Truman gathered some experts and some of his associates, and they evaluated the men, especially in this study, because women were limited in their careers. So he focused on the men and looked at how successful they were. Did his which of his bright kids turned out to be very successful in their work. And um, you know, if you lived up to your potential, um, he, he used income, but only if you were a businessman. If you were doing something else, then your income was certainly taken into consideration, but if you were a brilliant professor but low pay, then you were still categorized as successful. Now, some of the classification was easy, so if you were a prominent doctor or lawyer or CEO or architect, then you made the cut. Um, and um, it turned out that uh, about a fifth of the men he classified as highly successful, and another fifth were deemed unsuccessful, and the rest were in between. Um, now, not all of the unsuccessful um, were in low status careers. So some were chemists or teachers or engineers, but they, they were, Terman decided they were pretty mediocre in their accomplishments. Remember, they started out selective as bright. One was a baker, and one was a letter carrier, one was a porter, one was a streetcar conductor. Again, Terman insisted none of these men last, lacked the intellectual capacity to, to thrive in their lives and their careers. So more than a half century later, we went back and we recreated Terman's groups of career success, and we used the occupational data, and then we looked on the long-term consequences on health and longevity. So it's a prospective study because we have information from a half century before, and we analyzed them extensively, their personalities, their ambition, their parents' mm -hmm. report of how the ambitious they thought their children were, and most importantly, we used the death certificates to try to see how long they lived. Well, this, these are survival curves. These are, for those of you who know, these are using proportional hazards regressions, but I'll explain this chart. In this kind of survival analysis, you want to be on the lowest line here because that means you're least likely to die by a given age. So those are the, 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 the three groups. And the results are very clear. Those with the most career success were the least likely to die young. In fact, the average, on average, the most successful men lived five years longer than the least successful. So the lowest line, again, the most, most successful and the least likely to die young. And if you know anything about epidemiology, epidemiology a five-year difference being predicted by this kind of variable is a huge effect. So those who were highly motivated, worked the hardest, steadily advanced in their careers, and achieved the most career success, lived the longest. They didn't work themselves to death, they worked themselves to life. Now, we don't have comparable detailed data on the women, but um, they, we, the, same, the same kinds of things were happening there as, as we looked in some case studies. And I'll give you just one example. Shelley Smith Midens was a, a Tremont participant, and she was a famous mag um, Life magazine reporter. She was captured by the Japanese in Manila during the World War II. She spent two years in captivity um, in a, in, in, until she was released in a prisoner exchange. Um, one of her duties while in prison camp was to pick the weevils out of the cereal. She, she later returned to overseas correspondence. She um, was worked in radio news, and she had a very successful career, and it's said that she faced more stressful adventures than a soldier of fortune. Did she die young? No, she lived a very long, healthy life, dying in 2002 at age 86. So our studies again made clear that facing adverse adversity and working hard was not a health risk. In fact, the exact opposite was true. Why is this? This is Norris Bradbury. Why did the successful live longer? Well, he was a publicly identified turbine participant. He became an atomic physicist. 
He worked on the Manhattan Project. He, he, he succeeded Robin, Robert Oppenheimer as director of Los Alamos, and um, he was hesitant about that job. He worked at it for decades. He was a very persistent, reliable guy, and what could be a more high-pressure job than being in charge of our nuclear research labs at a time of um, the Cold War pressures? So did all this stress enfeeble um, Norris Bradbury? Not at all. He, he was eventually presented with their highest honor, the Enrico Fermi Award. He was tremendously successful. And despite all this stress and pressure, he lived a very long life, past age 88. He was survived by his wife of 64 years, three children, seven grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. Let me put this in a slightly different context. Everyone knows that the rich and successful tend to live longer than the poor, and we often think that we know why, right? If I asked you, you'd probably say, well, the rich, they have the best doctors, the fanciest gyms, the safest homes, the best nutrition. This makes all the difference. Well, some cases, that is certainly true. But it's no, it's no doubt those mired in poverty have significant extra health risks. But much more is going on below the surface. Because if you look at people in the middle class, it turns out that people in the upper middle class live longer than people in the middle middle class. Right, so the people in the middle class, they have enough to eat, they have access to doctors, so why do they not live as long as the people who have slightly higher incomes than those? There must be something else going on here. Um, so in our study, we had a mostly middle class, educated sample of people, and yet the highly successful outlived their very bright peers who were less successful. Right, if their surroundings were alike, could it be something about the individuals themselves that somehow set them on trajectories that accounted for the difference? And this is indeed what we found. So in childhood, we had all sorts of parent and teacher ratings of personality. And we spent time forming these into validated scales. So this takes a lot of time uh, to create indexes and validate them using modern psychometric methods. But for example, in 1922, te teachers and parents rated the term in children in terms of prudence, freedom from vanity, conscientiousness, and truthfulness. Remember Lucy said, live honestly? This is how we were able to assess this. Well, um, in young adulthood, two decades later, we had a lot of detailed self-reports. So Terman collected all kinds of measures, personality measures. And again, we spent a lot, about a year con converting these into modern, reliable, valid personality skills. So we had a lot of very valuable, valid measures. And um, we looked to see which aspects of personality were most relevant. And we were surprised. One of the breakthrough findings of the Longevity Project was that the conscientious children and the conscientious adults stayed healthier and lived longer. That is, those who were persistent and prudent thrived. So um, this is conscientiousness in childhood. And um, it was a good predictor of mortality risk decades later. You, you would pr much rather be in the circle on the left that has a very small piece of dead pie. And follow-up analyses show that the, this childhood unconscientiousness predicted all-cause all -cause mortality risk and a whole bunch of unhealthy behaviors and situation selection, including adult smoking, adult alcohol, alcohol consumption, less social stability, less work stability, less accomplishment, and a whole bunch of other things. In other words, one of the core pathways is conscientiousness, success, other kinds of achievements, and then longevity. Now, um, you might say this is a select sample, and it is, but th this finding when it was first published, our first findings along these lines in the 1990s, led researchers around, around the world to say, well, I have some archival data sets. Let me see if I can replicate that. And so now it's been studied in Scotland, in New Zealand, in, in, in Italy, in, in, all, in the United States. A lot of studies look at this in Hawaii, and this result replicates and replicates and replicates. It's confirmed and confirmed and reconfirmed. The latest studies are, in fact, are looking at conscientiousness and cognitive decline and, and Alzheimer's disease, and it's coming out there as well. Here are the adults, same kind of thing. Conscientiousness in adulthood was the best predictor of mortality risk. Um, now, why is this in adulthood? Well, one of the reasons is that these conscientious individuals found their way to happier marriages, um, better friendships, healthier jobs. So this is the pattern of the self-healing personality. In many ways, persistence was key. Really interesting aside here is what happens as they got older. So um, in, in the, when they were in their 70s, Terman collected a lot of information about what they're doing. I mean, his, his followers did. And um, there were 720 participants this time men and women, who were still alive in the 1980s. And we studied whether 
each individual was productive, motivated, and accomplishing things. At the time a lot of people say, I'm 65, I'm going to retire and go to the beach. Some of them continued to work or pursue volunteer activities or setting new goals. Um, what happened to them? Well, again, the, the findings were dramatic. Looking over the next two decades, it was the people who were still involved, still working, still involved, um, who, who lived much longer than their laid back comrades. It wasn't that they said, well, I'm happy or I have a sense of meaning. They actually lived significantly longer. So this productive orientation mattered more than their sense of well-being. It was those who were most engaged in pursuing their goals. So again, um, ambition predicted career success and ambition coupled with perseverance, impulse control, and high ambition is part of the package of resilient work life. There's this positive feedback loop that gets going, a, a virtuous cycle. Now, uh, before we go on, I want to make an important distinction that I want you to get confused like some of my students do. So um, you have to distinguish a centurion from a centenarian. <laughs> You may have heard about it when um, Dolores Hope died at age um, 102. She was happily married to, to Bob Hope for um, almost 70 years. But given our findings, I should say Bob Hope was happily married to Dolores because um, he, died, he died at age 100. Um, and, uh, but it didn't affect the health or shorten the life of Dolores. She went on to live almost another decade. Now this is. This is an anecdote, but it illustrates pretty much what we found in the longevity project. So let me just say a word about marriage. So we know that numerous epidemiological studies have found that married men have a significantly lower mortality risk than single and divorced men. But the evidence is much weaker and sometimes non-existent for women. Now it's usually assumed that this is, is something about the protective effect of marriage, right? So maybe your spouse buffers you against stress. Maybe your spouse helps ensure that you take your pills on time and go to the doctor. Um, there's some evidence along those lines from other studies. But causes have been difficult to identify without a lifelong study. And in fact, the Longevity Project found that this common advice on those lists of 100 things to do, get married to stay healthy and live longer, it's not justified. So we studied the association between marital history and mi at midlife and mortality. And we, we categorized people in one of the ways we did it was like this. So we looked at 1950, when they were about 40 years old. We classified them, whether they were currently married and, and um, steadily married. They got married and stayed married. They were married, but they were not in their first marriage, so they were inconsistently married. They were still married in 1950. Um, were they currently divorced or separated, or were they never married? And then what happened from 1950 on? Well, here are the results. The men who were married in 1950, but had previously experienced seriously breakups, were um, at significantly higher mortality risk compared to con consistently married men. Now, um, both groups were, that's the first two columns there, they were currently married in 1950, so it can't be just marriage, right? Because they were both married, but the ones who had been divorced, um, they, they died sooner. Now, and we controlled for the number of years they were married, and that, that didn't matter at all. For women, we found something very different. Um, you can see that the women who got rid of their husbands, like uh, Emma Moreno did, they did, they did fine. And the women who never married, um, also OK. And this has been found subsequently in other studies. It turns out, this is not shown here, but women who are widowed, um, all, this also confirmed this. The, they usually stayed healthy, and they lived long without their husbands. Now, since divorce is, um, one of the greatest social stressors, right? We hear we all this advice to get married. Um, even if you're not suited to marriage or not in a good marriage, this is ironically may, may increase your risk rather than decrease your risk, um, right? You can't face the stress and problems of bad marriage and divorce if you don't get married. Statistically, 100% of all divorces begin with marriage. <laughs> now, um, we, we have evidence that conscientious predicts both stable marriage and longevity. So here again is the importance of um, responsible patterns, and we have other evidence along these lines. So if you're uh, a man and you're suited to marriage, and you can stay married and stay happily married, that's healthy. If you're a woman who can find a devoted, supportive husband, that's healthy. Otherwise, forget it. <laughs> so um, what you might say, well, why are, why are women protected even after divorce or widowhood? Well, we and others are finding more and more that this is um, social relationships. It's, it's friendships. So social networks are, are known to be very relevant to health, and we wanted to see how that worked and determine participants. 
So what did we do? We started combing the archives. We started combing these 10 million pieces of data. And we found all kinds of activities and relationships that are markers of social support. How frequently did you visit your relatives? How frequently did you see your friends, your neighbors? How often did you help your friends? How often did you help your neighbors? Um, did you do community service? Did you, are you satisfied with your friendships? How many intimate relationships have any, how many companionate relationships do you have? The quality of your relationships with your family and friends. Um, community groups, um, do you go to lectures at UCSD? This would count, right? All those kinds of things were, were in the data. Um, and we were able to con condense this and, and create indexes of how much social relationships and how qu the quality of them. And then we again, we validated these against existing known valid measures of social support. So again, it could take a year to gather all this information and create a valid index, reduce it with factor analysis, test it on other current measures, sometimes bringing in new participants. Just to give you some idea about it, you can't just pull out a variable from the data and look at it. You have to do a whole study to find out how this works. Well, we figured that if the participants um, felt loved and cared for, they would live the longest. But we found, surprise, that did not matter that much for living a long life. Instead, it was the social networks. Yes, um, a clear finding was that those who had strong social networks saw lots of people in their daily lives, had friends, strong friendships, they lived longer. Now, a funny example of this um, is um, some of the participants, especially when we started, were still missing. Now we mostly tracked them all down. We thought, well, could they be alive? Maybe that's why they're missing. Um, we know that, generally speaking, people who have strong social networks live longer, right? So we thought, my students said, social networks live longer? I have an idea. Where can we find some of these participants? And sure enough, they found this guy right there on Facebook. <laughs> um, so beyond social networks, the clearest benefit of, of social um, relationships came from helping others. So this isn't shown here, but those who help their friends and neighbors, um, advising and caring for others, tended to live to a, a ripe old age. So those who had good social relations, because they helped others, um, were actually reaping a benefit for themselves. Really um, wonderful finding um, that I think is really underappreciated. So if you were involved with helping others, you had a real benefit in terms of your, your longevity. And who was usually playing this role? It was usually the women who were, who were doing this. Some threats are random and unpredictable. So if a meteor falls out of the sky and strikes you, there's little you could have done to prevent it. That's occasionally happened a few times in modern history. But the point here is that such seemingly random events are not really um, usually so random in our, in our daily lives. Rather, many good and bad events that happen to you happen because of your inclinations, happen because of your personality, happen because of the social situations that you put yourself in and how you live your life. That is, um, individuals often select and elicit their accomplishments or their troubles. Um, this is really underappreciated, and I think it's absolutely necessary to understanding healthy aging. So um, that's why we get endless lists of, endless lists of advice. The people who are growing and aging in good health are usually doing so because they're on a healthy trajectory. Now think about it. How can things from childhood predict how healthy you're going to be decades later? It's probably not some simple direct tie. That might be a small part of it. But it has to be a lot of steps along the way. And um, people are doing one thing after another, a trajectory or a pathway that develops over the years. And certain people bring good things to themselves, bring health to themselves. And I have to tell you one, one example of this, which illustrates this point. It's about um, the Terman men who served in the Second World War. So five of the participants were killed in the war, a fairly small number. But many of the participants were indirect casualties of the war. They died um, years later as a result of their wartime experiences. Um, but many um, veterans. They had seen awful things, and they thrived. And you probably know people this. Maybe some of you are uh, oh, a veteran who's, who's been that way. You thrived years later, even though you've, you saw some very traumatic kinds of things. So what's the difference? Um, well, um, here's what we did is we decided to divide up the veterans. And um, this is part of a study of veterans and, and stress and health. But this is a really interesting aspect of it. 
this is how we divided up the veterans. So some, went, some, some were, didn't go into the war at all. Some went overseas who were in the, in, the, in the services. Some were exposed to combat. Some were in Europe. And some were in the stressful Pacific theater. So the Pacific War was, was objectively the most stressful, the most challenging, the most traumatic. So there's a lot of studies of this. If you were fighting island to island in the South Pacific, that was the most stressful kind of thing you could be if you were a man of that age in the 1940s. Here are two important conclusions. First, severe combat exposure led to significant health risks in some of these men if it led to heavy drinking later or disrupted social relations after the war. And this is a finding we find again and again. People who go through a traumatic event but get back on track, whether it's parental divorce, whether it's trauma in the war, develop good relationships, don't develop bad habits, they actually do fine, even though they still remember the stress, the shock. That's important, but here's the, what the real shock, when you talk about shock, conscientiousness in childhood predicted the environments they would encounter. A reliable effect. Somehow, the conscientious termed men were um, the le less conscientious termed men. Sorry, the less conscientious termed men were more likely to be sent to the really stressful South Pacific venue. Right. So, the more careless, vain, and impulsive a man had been as a child, that the parents and teachers rated them in the 1920s, the more likely you wind up you were to wind up fighting the Japanese in the South Pacific decades later. Okay. So um, a key theme emerging from the Longevity Project was the amazing finding that personality and social relations from earlier in life would predict one's risk of dying decades later through this step-by-step -step process. People head off on certain pathways. We call them certain trajectories, which make them healthier and healthier or bring them more and more risk. So good things cluster together in some people and bad things cluster together in other people. Sometimes there are chance events. Sometimes there are certainly genetic interventions. But over overwhelmingly, these are the patterns we see. But of course, some people, we saw this, changed their life pathways, so it's not written in stone. Some people decided to do some things, and we could talk more about that, are things that got people onto healthier life pathways. And this is, um, we call this the surprising extent to which you can make your own luck. I'll give you um, one more example of trajectories. So this is physical activity. You hear a lot about this, and you hear, get out there and exercise. Well. Um, these are, these are physical activity patterns. I've simplified the data here somewhat. We don't use these kinds of analyses, but this is average age of death. And um, we have hobby reports on the participants throughout their years. So we coded these in terms of metabolic activity, being physically active. So we know if you were like to go to movies or you like to be a runner. We know if you like to be in a reading group or you like to go surfing, on and on and on. Um, we, we know the kinds of things that people um, were involved in, and this chart shows the effects of physical activity from about when they were in their 20s to about age 60. So remember, these are the core years that I'm focusing on, what happens between 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and, and, and to about 60, and how that's going to affect what happens in your 50s, 60s, and 70s. These are the years for studying that core variability that I talked about at the very beginning. So these histograms are average age of death as a function of activity trajectories. You can see that the, those who led highly active lives and stayed active, they lived much longer. So those, that's the last column. They were high when they were young, and they stayed active, and they lived longest. And look how look at that huge difference in longevity. Remember, these were all healthy children at age 10 to be, to be in the study. And we also excluded people who died before 1940. So these were people who were, who were healthy in their younger years. And look at the huge effect you have there. Um, so um, what, what was, um, if you, you could have a rocky start. If you were low and you increased, that's the third column there, you also lived quite long. So you could have a rocky start, but you could get back on the track, literally back on the track, right? And, that, and you would live almost as long as people who were always active. What was perhaps most interesting to me, is, to me is that those who were very active earlier in life, such as athletes in college, but then they became more of a couch potato, they were not protect, protected, even though they started out really in super shape. They died significantly earlier. So we actually have the actual trajectories of each individual plotted out. So um, if we're trying to do societal programs to promote a healthy generation, we need not to think in terms of months or years of activity. We need to think in terms of decades of activity. Now overall, sitting around was a terrible thing to do for your health. Um, 
physical activity in these years did not mean going to the gym. In fact, for a lot of their lives, there were no gyms. It, it meant having an active daily life. Again, it meant being involved, not sitting around. Now I could show you analogous trajectory charts of community involvement across the decades, of religious involvement across the decades, of education. Um, you might want to ask me about education. Um, but we don't have to think of staying healthy as struggling against endless threats, endless challenges, making endless lists. I didn't do the 100 things on my list today. Rather, we can view our health promotion efforts as helping people get on the healthy pathways that become self-sustaining, again, this kind of virtuous circle. Okay, well, where does this, this leave, leave us? One major scientific conclusion is that individuals quite often select and elicit accomplishments or other people select and elicit trouble in their lives. Personality, characteristics, and social relations from each stage earlier in life predict one's, list of one's risk of dying years later in a step-by-step -step fashion. People head off down certain pathways which makes them healthier and healthier or brings them more and more risk. So um, good things cluster together in some people and bad things cluster together in other people. What are our conclusions? Good character and good social relations are not only a moral and a social issue, but they're a major health matter. Accomplishments, living with purpose, and productive engagement with others comprise self-reinforcing lifespan patterns to health, to happiness, and to long life. So health needs to be thought of as a trajectory or a vector, not an instantaneous state. It's not random who enters and sustains good educations, flourishing marriages, community ties, successful careers, and so on. So each time we nudge someone to being more persistent, more conscientious, more prudent, more plentifully involved with others, more helpful to others, we increase the odds that many more outcomes, any more, many more positive outcomes will follow as each good step leads to another step. Again, this kind of self-sustaining virtuous circle. So when we think about societal interventions, those of you interested in public policy, we might ask whether our societal interventions promote positive inter interactions with others. Are they promoting volunteering? Are they promoting cooperative learning? Are they promoting team efforts? Are they promoting mutual aid? These are all the things that are going to make a big difference. It turns out that people who cope with life's challenges in a mature manner and a, a, a maintain deep social relationships, are nice to other people, help other people, they fare best. If you're persistent and prudent on top of that, things get even better. You live much longer. Rather than fretting themselves to death, if you're persistent and prudent, these people are concerned enough to keep themselves alive. So taking on new challenges, being fresh in the moment, these are long-term healthy patterns. Um, the, the patterns and pathways come first and lead both to health and to happiness, it turns out. Happiness and health are correlated, but it's not the happiness itself that's usually causing the health. It's these underlying pathways that are leading people to be healthier and happier. So these terminal participants who were very happy, they didn't live in a land of self-esteem clinics, indulgent parents, always focusing on themselves. It was the hands-on pieces that mattered the most. Being conscientious, staying active, helping others, having healthy, healthy friends, and working on um, a successful career or a career volunteering, helping others. These were the real um, pathways to longevity. So what about this assertion of Daniel Defoe and Billy Joel and all the others that the good die young? Remember Defoe said, the best of men cannot suspend their fate, the good die early and the bad die late. Not true, not true. We didn't find that at all. It was not the self-indulgent feel-good aspects that mattered for, for, to for keeping young. Toting up all these characteristics, we found that the truth is it's the good folks who help shape their faith. The brash bums succumb while the good do great. <laughs> Thank you very much.